So a case of six-year-old boy presenting with a one-week history of nausea, vomiting, and headaches. And these are the images provided. So you can see that on the non-contrast CT scan, there's a large high attenuation mass which is centered within the fourth ventricle. Okay, so this mass is centered within the fourth ventricle. This is the large high attenuation mass. On MRI, you can see that this is the intraventricular mass. This is the intraventricular mass, which is, uh, you can say that uh, hyper intense. Uh, this is the mass which is hyper intense on T1 and this is hyper intense on T2 and it is hyper intense on DWI as well. On the post contrast uh, sequence, it is, this is the DWI and it is hyper intense on uh, uh, the DWI and I think this one here is the, this is the T2 sequence. This is the T2 sequence, it's hyper intense on T2 and this is the post contrast sequence and it shows the uh, heterogeneous enhancement. So this is the heterogeneous enhancement of the mass, this is DWI showing restriction, diffusion restriction and uh, also this is the hyper intensity of the mass, interventricular mass. Uh, also on this uh, flare sequence, axial flare sequence, you can see that there is obviously obstructive hydrocephalus. This is the interventricular lesion, so this is causing the obstructive hydrocephalus with transependymal edema. This is the transependymal edema. This hyperintensity around this, uh, around the lateral ventricle, is uh, called transependymal edema. So with transependymal edema, there is obstructive hydrocephalus. This is the interventricular mass. So uh, the basic uh, diagnosis here is of medulloblastoma. This is the case of medulloblastoma, but in the differentials, you can put uh, ependymoma, ATRT, there is atypical uh, teratoid rhabdoid tumor, pilocytic astrocytoma, uh, choroid plexus papilloma, or carcinoma and brainstem glioma. Next is case of a 43, 43-year-old woman was uh, found unresponsive. And uh, these are the images provided. So, as you can see that on the non-contrast CT scan, uh, there is symmetric and uh, heterogeneous hypoattenuation in the lentiform nuclei, yeah, in the lentiform nuclei bilaterally. And uh, foci of increased attenuation, there are small, tiny foci of increased attenuation. So, they likely represent the petechial hemorrhage. Okay, now this is the MRI. This is the MRI sequence, and uh, as you can see, that uh, it is largely this lesion is uh, largely it is uh, so this lesion is hyper intense on T2. And abnormal signal extends into both the medial temporal lobes. Okay, it is extending into the medial temporal lobes. And uh, on the DWI, you can see that there is no hyperintensity, that is, there is no restricted diffusion. This is flare sequence, and you can see that uh, there is hyperintensity here in the same region and uh, it is extending into both the medial temporal lobes okay and uh, areas with hypo intensity uh, the areas that are hypo intense on uh, t2 and uh, the areas that are hypo intense on t2 and hyper on t1 they likely represent hemorrhage and also this is the post contrast uh, sequence and it shows the intense peripheral enhancement so these lesions are basically presenting with intense peripheral enhancement so this uh, is a typical imaging picture of methanol poisoning okay so symmetric heterogeneous uh, hypoattenuation in the in the lentiform nuclei on ct and corresponding with the mr imaging findings is quite characteristic for methanol poisoning However, in the differentials, you can put Lee disease, Kane sire syndrome, Wilson disease, osmotic demyelination, and uh, Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. Now, this is uh, a patient two year old with seizures and uh, left hemiparesis presenting uh, with 
procedures in left hemiparesis and these are the images provided so as you can see that uh, the t1 and t2 weighted images they show a fluid that is uh, csf filled cleft here so this is the csf filled cleft which is extending from the surface of the right hemisphere it is extending from the surface of the right hemisphere to the left lateral ventricle the margins of the cleft are lined by the dysplastic or polymicrogyric gray matter okay so this is the gray matter this is the gray matter which is this is the this is the gray matter which is lining this cleft so this is a case of schizencephaly typical imaging picture of schizencephaly and in the differentials you can put porencephaly post operative cavity or cleft in gray matter heterotopia next is a case of a 5 year old boy it's uh, presenting with mild developmental delay and uh, these are the images so on non contrast ct you can see that there is a prominence of the posterior aspect of the lateral ventricles which is called colpocephaly okay so this is colpocephaly here on the sagittal t1 weighted mri there is absence of the corpus callosum this total absence of the you can see this the corpus callosum is absent and the medial sulci of the hemisphere radially they extend all the way they extend all the way to the margins of the third ventricle okay here so this is the third ventricle these are the sulci and they are extending uh, all the way to the margins of the third ventricle on the these are the t2 weighted images on these t2 weighted images we can see that the corpus callosum is absent at the midline there is absent corpus callosum the lateral ventricles here they have a parallel configuration okay they have a parallel configuration and there is a small there's small bundle of uh, white matter which is called bundle of props here this this one this black line this is the small bundle of uh, white matter which is called bundle of props and it is running anterior posteriorly along the medial aspect of the lateral ventricles okay along the medial aspect of the lateral ventricles it is running and uh, on the coronal image this configuration of the ventricles is resembling a texas longhorn okay this is typical texas longhorn appearing image of this uh, lateral ventricles of this ventricles the texas longhorn i mean so these are the typical imaging description of the case of agenesis of the corpus callosum so this is a case of agenesis of the corpus callosum and in the differentials you can put hydrocephalus because it's stretching and thinning of this hydrocephalus may cause the stretching and thinning of the corpus callosum neonatal corpus callosum can also be very thin periventricular leukomalacia with associated white matter and corpus callosum uh, volume loss can also be put and post surgical callosotomy can also be put in the differentials next is 22 year old woman uh, presenting with weakness in all the four extremities these are the images provided so you can see that uh, on the post contrast t1 weighted image there are bilateral enhancing masses here bilateral enhancing masses in the internal auditory canals and the cerebellopontine angles okay also there are multiple dural based dural based extra axial masses here over the cerebral convexities these are these dural based masses over the cerebral convexities the contrast enhanced sagittal image of the cervical spine shows the enhancing intramedullary masses within the spinal cord okay so these are the enhancing intra here as well these are the enhancing intramedullary uh, masses within the cervical cord and uh, this is the contrast enhanced t1 sagittal image of the lumbar spine and it shows the multiple small enhancing nodular masses along the corda equina so the uh, these masses are present along the corda equina so this is a typical imaging uh, presentation of uh, neurofibromatosis type 2 that is nf2 and uh, in the differentials you can put metastasis of course multiple meningiomas post radiation schwannomatosis lymphoma 
and neurosarcoidosis. So, another case of a neonate presenting with large head size and these are the images provided. So, as you can see here that uh, the lateral and the third ventricles are enlarged. The lateral and the third ventricles here, these are the lateral ventricles and uh, this is the third ventricle. So, both of them they are enlarged and uh, this is the third ventricle, sorry, the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle. So, both of them they are enlarged. The corpus callosum is stretched and thin. Okay, the corpus callosum is obviously it is stretched and it is thin. And uh, however, the fourth ventricle that we see here, it is normal in size. The fourth ventricle is normal. The cerebral aqueduct is very narrow. Okay, here the cerebral aqueduct is very narrow and uh, there is no mass present. In the whole imaging sequences, there is no mass. You can't see, you're not seeing any mass here. However, there is uh, absolutely enlargement of these uh, lateral and third ventricles. So, uh, in the uh, this is a case of aqueductal stenosis. This is a typical case of aqueductal stenosis, uh, which is causing this massive enlargement of the ventricles. And uh, in the differentials, you can put neoplasms or cysts around the aqueduct that is in the penile region tumors or the tectal glioma or the raconoid cysts and also post-inflammatory aqueductal gliosis after hemorrhage or infection can be put in this differential. Next is 84-year-old man with lung cancer and uh, the screening MRI is done here for metastasis and these are the images provided. So, as you can see that uh, this is the post-contrast uh, sequence and uh, there is a small focus of enhancement here, little bit, a tiny focus of enhancement in the left basis pontus. Okay, this is the left basis pontus and there is a very tiny focus of enhancement here. Uh, there is, uh, this is the, okay, so this is T2 weighted MRI and there is a very subtle focus of hyper enhancement or hyper intense signal, I would say. Uh, in this region on T2 weighted MRI. So, T2 weighted MRI on T2 weighted MRI, it is quite subtle hyper intense and there is no mass effect here. Okay, and on the GRI image, I would say on the T2 star weighted GRI sequence, the corresponding focus is actually giving the hypo intense signal, which is very consistent with susceptibility related signal loss or you can say blooming artifact. So, this is a typical case of capillary telangiectasia. Uh, this is a typical case of capillary telangiectasia. And uh, in the differentials, you can put pontine hemorrhage, obviously collaborating with the, this blood product, blooming, blooming, uh, this blooming foci. So we can say that this is pontine hemorrhage or metastasis or any demyelinating disease. Next is a five-year-old girl with two-week history of ataxia. So, these are the images that are provided. Here you can see that uh, this is a multiloculated cystic mass of the right cerebellar hemisphere with an enhancing mural nodule. This is that enhancing mural nodule. Okay, this, this is a post contrast sequence. So, this is the enhancing mural nodule. This is the axial sequence post contrast. This is the coronal, and there is the enhancing mural nodule here. It is causing a compression of the fourth ventricle, okay. It is causing compression of the fourth ventricle, which is resulting in the obstructive hydrocephalus. There is enlargement of the horns of the lateral ventricle. So, this is the uh, obstructive hydrocephalus, which is caused by this mass. And uh, this mass is actually compressing the fourth ventricle. There is no calcification or hemorrhage here because On CT as well, you can see that there is no calcification or hemorrhage here. So, this is a typical case of pilocytic astrocytoma. 
considering the age of the child. This is a five-year-old girl, so this is pilocytic astrocytoma. And in the differentials, you can put hemangioblastoma, medulloblastoma, ependymoma, ATRT, or dorsal exophytic brainstem glioma. Next is 54-year-old man presenting with dysphasia and right-hand weakness. These are the images provided. So, you can see that on the non-contrast CT scan, there is hypoattenuation within the left centrum semi oval and the adjacent subcortical white matter. So, this is the hypoattenuation which is involving the left centrum semi oval and the adjacent subcortical white matter. On the MRI images, you can see that, uh, <coughs> sorry, so these, this is a flare image which is showing the hyper intense signal here. And uh, this is the DWI, which is again showing the hyper intense signal in the corresponding area. So, which is consistent uh, with obviously diffusion restriction. So, this is uh, basically acute or subacute infarction. This is a case of acute or subacute infarction. Uh, and this is border zone infarction actually because uh, of the parasagittal arrangement of the infarcts. This distribution, the parasagittal arrangement of the infarcts conforms to the border zone between the middle and the anterior cerebral arteries. This is a border zone. That's why this is border zone infarction. Now, you can see that this, these are the perfusion-weighted uh, mapping and it shows a regional reduction in the cerebral blood flow in the same region. And uh, in the same region, there is a reduction of the blood flow. This is the gadolinium uh, enhanced uh, MRA and it reveals the severe that is greater than 70% almost focal stenosis at left internal carotid artery origin. Okay, so this is a case of border zone infarction. In the differentials, you can include embolic infarction, lacunar infarction, vasculitis or demyelination. Next is a three-year-old boy uh, presenting with small head circumference and developmental delay. These are the images provided. Now, as you can see that on the CT scan, uh, there are numerous punctate, punctate calcifications in the brain and many of them are in a periventricular distribution. Okay, this is periventricular, periventricular, periventricular here. Periventricular distribution of these calcifications is noted, punctuate or punctate calcifications and uh, also uh, there are uh, subtle scattered areas of white matter hypoattenuation. Okay, you can see that this is white matter hypoattenuation, white matter hypoattenuation. Very subtle, but it is there. It is very much there. So, now coming towards MRI sequences, this flare and uh, um, this is T2-bitter MRI. So on the flare, you can see that there are patchy areas of uh, abnormal hyperintensity in the white matter, including uh, the temporal lobe. Okay, so this is the temporal lobe. So you can see here that these are the patchy white matter hyperintensities in the flare and T2-bitter sequences in the white matter. So, the main diagnosis here is a congenital infection of cytomegalovirus that is CMV infection. But in the differentials, of course, you'll have to include uh, tuberous sclerosis or congenital toxoplasmosis or megalencephalic leukoencephalopathy with subcortical cysts and pseudotorch syndromes. Next is 8-year-old boy. Uh, presenting with progressive learning and behavioral disorders and worsening vision with hearing. These are the images provided. Now you can see that on CT scan, there is a decreased attenuation 
in the splenium of the corpus callosum and the posterior white matter okay in the splenium of the corpus callosum and the posterior white matter there is hypoattenuation or decreased attenuation in the same area in the very same area there is hyper intensity on t2 weighted and flare sequences this is the flare sequence and in the same region it is showing hyper intensity this is hyper intense on t2 hyper intense on flare and a hypo intense or oh, sorry hypo attenuation on ct on the post contrast sequence uh, we can see that there is a leading edge of the enhancement along the periphery of this white matter area of signal abnormality this is the white matter area of signal abnormality and this is the peripheral enhancing leading edge of the enhancement this is the leading edge of the enhancement so this imaging picture is quite typical for x-linked adrenal leukodystrophy that is x-linked adrenal leukodystrophy this is a case of x-linked ald in the differentials you can put alexander disease metachromatic leukodystrophy neonatal hypoglycemia or periventricular leukomalacia Next is a 12-year-old boy with chronic headache and uh, paresthesias in the hands bilaterally. So these are the images that are provided here. So looking at these images, you can see that in the sagittal T2 weighted MRI, it shows the extension of the cerebellar tonsils below the foramen magnum. This is the foramen magnum and the tonsils are extending below it to the level of the posterior arch of C1 okay to the level of the posterior arch of C1 and uh, there is a pointed configuration of the tonsils here okay this is the pointed configuration of the tonsils this is the axial T2 weighted MRI and it is showing crowding at the foramen magnum this is the crowding at the foramen magnum and the effacement of the uh, this is the crowding of the foramen magnum and uh, effacement of the here effacement of the csf spaces around the cervical medullary junction here also in the sagittal sequence you can see that there is syringohydromyelia syringohydromyelia in the cervical spinal cord so these imaging uh, findings are quite typical for KRE1 malformation and uh, this is a case of KRE1 malformation. In the differentials you can include normal tonsillar displacement below the foramen magnum without KRE1 malformation. Uh, also KRE2 malformation can be included here and in acquired cerebellar tonsillar herniation from the intracranial mass effect. All of these can be the differentials. Next is a 5 month old girl. Uh, presenting with post fall of a couch these are the images now this is the CT scan which is showing uh, axial image CT scan showing bifrontal prominent extra axial spaces containing curvilinear curvilinear high attenuation material representing the subdural blood okay a small amount of uh, subdural blood also layers along the posterior fox and the left occipital lobe here okay so posterior fox left occipital lobe and the blood over here in the bilateral frontal lobes in the you know the, the small amount of uh, the subdural blood this is the subdural blood in the bifrontal prominent extra axial spaces the flare image this is the flare image and it is quite normal except for a small amount of uh, this uh, very small amount of the hyper intense extra axial blood extra axial blood uh, overlying the parietal lobes okay here so this is the small amount of hyper intense extra axial blood uh, which is overlying the parietal lobes this is the adc map and it shows the low signal within the bilateral occipital cortices 
these are the occipital cortices they're showing a low signal uh, which is not seen on the other sequences okay it's not seen on the sequences but these are uh, the hyper intense low signal within the bilateral occipital cortices so this is quite typical uh, picture of non-accidental trauma this is a case of non-accidental trauma and in the differentials, you can acu uh, put acute or subacute subdural hematomas with cortical ischemic injury. So this is a nine-year-old boy, a case of nine-year-old boy with progressive gait abnormality, uh, spasticity, dystonia, abnormal movements, and dysarthria. And uh, these are the images that are provided here. So as you can see that on the T2 weighted image, there are abnormal, abnormal, uh, symmetric bilateral uh, T2 hypo intensity here in the globus pallidae bilaterally, with the more central uh, focus of T2 hyper intensity. Okay, these are the hypo intensities in the bilateral globus pallidae, along with the central focus of T2 hyper intensity which is producing the eye of the tiger sign okay this is the eye of the tiger appearance on the t1 weighted image uh, on the t1 weighted image uh, there is only slight t1 hypo intensity only slight t1 hypo intensity in the globus pallidae so this is the t1 weighted image and very slight very slight t1 hypo intensity in the globus pallidus these are the DWI and ADC maps and you can see that there are no areas of uh, restricted diffusion here. They do not show any areas of restricted diffusion here. So this is uh, a typical case of pantothenate kinase associated neurodegeneration, PCAN. And in the differentials, you can include uh, hypoxic injury, carbon monoxide toxicity, carnectaris, physiologic globus pallidus T2 hypo intensity in the adults and older teenagers, and other metabolic disorders such as Kian Sire and neuronal ceroid lipofuscinosis. Next is a 38 year old woman uh, with sudden onset of severe recurrent headache five days ago. So these are the images that are provided here. So as you can see that on the non-contrast CT scan, there is high attenuation, high attenuation subarachnoid hemorrhage within the sulci of the left cerebral convexity here. On the MIP reconstruction image from CT angiography, there are areas of uh, irregular stenosis of the there are areas these are the areas irregular stenosis of the middle and the posterior cerebral arteries okay of the middle and the posterior cerebral arteries okay middle and posterior cerebral arteries also this is the digital subtraction image uh, digital subtraction and geography image and there are uh, extensive segmental areas of alternating focal stenosis and dilatation that is beading of the large and medium sized branches of the anterior and the middle cerebral arteries okay here alternate beading dilatation areas of beading alternate dilatation stenosis dilatation stenosis so this is a case of reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome uh, and uh, the differentials can include priori CNS vasculitis, vasculitis related to the systemic autoimmune disease like SLE or infection and mycotic aneurysms. Next is 54-year-old man presenting with three weeks progressive vision loss. These are the images. Now, as you can see that uh, there is large, there is a large cellar and supracellar mass and uh, this tumor has uh, this tumor has a waste at the level of the diaphragma cellae here it's, it's, its waste is here at the level of diaphragma cellae 
and uh, this mass is uh, T1 ISO here you can see that this is T1 ISO this is a T1 image it is ISO intense and on T2 also it is hypo intense here this is ISO intense here it is hypo intense and it shows uh, mild enhancement on the post contrast sequence because okay, it's mild enhancement so there is possible extension into the right cavernous sinus as well you can say that there is uh, this possibly possibly this is extending into the right uh, cavernous sinus so the basic uh, diagnosis here is of pituitary macroadenoma this is a typical picture of pituitary macroadenoma and in the differentials you can include meningioma germ cell tumor craniopharyngioma glial tumor lymphocytic hypophysitis and metastasis next is 21 year old man with lower extremity pain and weakness these are the provided images now as you can see that on the t2 weighted mri and this is the post contrast t1 weighted mri there are multiple enhancing lesions in the cerebellum now this is one of them this is another of them this is one of them this is one of them so there are multiple enhancing lesions in the cerebellum okay this is another lesion this is the lesion this is the lesion so multiple the largest lesion on the left has a cyst with an enhancing mural nodule appearance this is called a typical picture of a cyst with an enhancing mural nodule appearance the t2 weighted these are the sagittal images t2 weighted and post contrast t1 weighted images of the lumbar spine they show an enhancing this is the enhancing uh, intradural mass this is the post contrast sequence so it is showing the enhancement of this lesion this is the enhancing intradural mass and uh, there are associated vascular flow voids here these are the vascular flow void here this is the vascular flow void so also these are the vascular flow voids and they are suggestive of a highly vascular lesion so this is the case of one hippelandau disease a very important and typical case for exam one hippelandau disease and uh, in the differentials you can put metastasis and pilocytic astrocytoma okay this is the case of a for coming towards the spine exam cases this is 48 year old woman uh, presenting with the lower back pain and uh, these are the images that are provided here so as you can see this is the ct myelogram image uh, with sagittal reformatting and it shows the uh, ventral displacement and compression of the spinal cord at t8 t10 level with dorsal expansion dorsal expansion of the subarachnoid space here okay so this is the dorsal expansion of the subarachnoid space and it is the ventral displacement and compression of the spinal cord the sagittal and uh, axial t2 weighted images here this is the t2 weighted image sagittal and uh, this is the axial so they are showing the similar displacement here it is displacing the spinal cord and within the central spinal cord within this uh, central spinal cord above the level of the cord compression uh, there is an area of signal uh, similar to csf here okay this is the area of uh, signal which is very similar to csf which is consistent with syrinx so you can say that this is a syrinx this signal is very similar to syrinx so this is a syrinx so this is the uh, case of arachnoid cyst and uh, in the differentials you can put dural herniation of the spinal cord and dural ectasia although this is a typical imaging description of arachnoid cyst next is a 15 year old boy with non germinomatous germ cell tumor status post uh, uh, chemotherapy and radiation 
and these are the images that are provided now you can see that there are multiple nodular lesions along the corda equina here these are the multiple nodular lesions along the corda equina and they are present at the level of l1 and uh, here as well so l4 and l5 levels okay so the enhancement of these lesions is best demonstrated on here on the axial sequence post contrast t1 weighted sequence with fat saturation this is showing that these lesions are enhancing the bone marrow signal is normal here and here as well the bone marrow signals are normal so this is a typical case of drop metastasis these are the drop metastasis and uh, in the differentials you can include lymphoma or uh, infectious or inflammatory meningitis that is herpes lyme disease or uh, sarcoidosis or cmv and uh, neurofibromatosis type 2 multiple schwannomas and meningiomas malignant multiple neurofibromas and arachnoiditis so these are the differentials next is 77 year old woman uh presenting with the sudden onset of uh, lower extremity paralysis and loss of sensation below the umbilicus so these are the images that are provided on the t2 weighted images we can see that there is a hyper intense signal within the central aspect of the lower thoracic cord which is extending across the multiple segments to the just above the conus okay so this hyper intense signal is starting from the lower thoracic cord and it is extending up to the conus just above the conus and uh, on the post contrast sequences we can see that uh, there is no enhancement okay so there is no enhancement in this lesion on post contrast sequence and uh, there are also multiple old vertebral compression fractures here okay these are the old compression fractures okay multiple old compression this is compression fracture this is a fracture this is a fracture okay yeah here is a fracture so these are old multiple compression fractures so this is a case of spinal cord infarction okay this is the spinal cord infarction here and uh, uh, in the differentials you can include uh, transverse myelitis uh, multiple sclerosis and spinal dural arteriovenous fistula and spinal cord astrocytoma next is a 60 year old woman presenting with the back pain and uh, these are the images provided now as you can see that uh, the conus terminates at the l4 level here this is the conus which is terminating at the l4 level and it has a smoothly tapered configuration and uh, the conus merges with a thickened and fatty phylum terminal that is this is the hyper intense signal on the t1 axial image and the conus is merging with this thickened and fatty phylum terminal so this is a case of uh, tethered cord this is a case of tethered cord and uh, in the differentials you can put uh, uh, like you have to evaluate the other abnormalities of the spinal cord and vertebrae uh, if you see this lesion so this is quite characteristic for this entity this imaging appearance is typical for tethered cord so basically there are no other differentials next is uh, a 58 year old man presenting with back pain progressing to quadriplegia over the course of 2 weeks these are the images that are provided here so starting with the images this is the sagittal t2 weighted mri and this is the stir sequence and it shows a t2 hyper intense okay a t2 hyper intense loculated dorsal epidural collection in the mid thoracic spine 
it is hyper intense on stir as well and it is hyper intense on p2 as well now these are the the post contrast t1 weighted image this is the post contrast image and uh, it is showing that uh, there is peripheral enhancement here this is peripheral enhancement there is peripheral enhancement uh, this uh, ab about the collection this is the collection and there is peripheral enhancement of this collection there is a small site of ventral epidural uh, enhancement as well ventral epidural enhancement okay and uh, the adjacent mid thoracic intervertebral disc here mid thoracic intervertebral disc shows abnormal signal and uh, irregular height loss and uh, this is associated with the extensive marrow edema uh, within the adjacent vertebral bodies this is the extensive marrow edema this is the marrow edema within the adjacent vertebral bodies associated with it there is the abnormal signal and irregular height loss so this is a typical imaging picture of epidural abscess this is the epidural abscess along with spondylodiscitis epidural abscess along with spondylodiscitis and uh, in the differentials you can put uh, epidural hematoma and extradural tumor there is metastasis next is uh, a case of 36 year old woman uh, presenting with slowly progressive bilateral leg weakness and uh, these are the images provided now there are extensive there is extensive as you can see here there is extensive signal abnormality in the cervical spinal cord it is a hyper intense on d2 and uh, it is uh, hypo intense on d1 and also there is marked cord expansion okay this marked cord expansion hypo on t1 and the hyper on t2 and uh, also there is a small nodular intramedullary mass at the c5 level and uh, it is heterogeneously enhancing uh, there is a heterogeneously enhancing intramedullary mass at uh, c7 as well uh, there is a prominent vessel arising from the neoplasm here okay so there is a prominent vessel uh, this is the vessel okay so there is a prominent um, vessel which is uh, arising from the neoplasm and extending along the ventral aspect of the cord this is the ventral aspect of the cord this is the vessel which is arising from this mass and uh, also there is a very small uh, enhancing nodule uh, there is a very small enhancing nodule in the cerebellum at the upper margins of the image okay so here here you can see this is the enhancing nodule in the upper margin of the image so always and always look for the corners of the films during exams this is the enhancing nodule in the upper margins of the image and these are the masses and uh, this is the vessel which is arising from the mass extending along the ventral aspect of the cord so this is a case of spinal cord hemangioblastoma this is a typical case of spinal cord hemangioblastoma and in the differentials you can put metastasis astrocytoma ependymoma lymphoma or any inflammatory or infectious disease like sarcoidosis or fungus next is a 22 year old man uh, presenting with decreased strength in the left arm after a motorcycle accident these are the images so as you can see that there is a very well demarcated collection here and here with signal characteristics similar to CSF and it is extending here is extending through the left C6 to C7 neural foramen here C6 to C7 neural foramen it is extending through the left C6 C7 neural foramen 
no nerve root is present within this collection. You can see that there is no nerve root within this collection. The spinal cord here, the spinal cord is shifted towards the evolved nerve root. Okay. And on the coronal T2 weighted MRI, there is also, you can see that there is signal abnormality in the left scalene muscle, which is consistent with denervation. So this is a typical case of nerve root evulsion and pseudomeningocele. And uh, in the differentials, you can put meningocele and nerve sheet tumor. Next is a 77-year-old man presenting with the progressive lower extremity weakness and positive Webinski sign. A CT myelogram is obtained because the patient has a pacemaker. So that's why CT was done. So as you can see, these are the provided images. These are other images. And these are the images. So the myelogram here shows a large filling defect in the spinal canal. This is the filling defect. And uh, the acute angles of the, the acute angles of the contrast column, they are showing that this is an intradural mass, okay? Because it is forming the acute angles, the contrast column is forming the acute angles, so this is an intradural mass. This is the CT myelogram image, and uh, it shows that the mass is uh, ventrally located, actually and it is displacing the spinal cord posteriorly. This is the cord which is being pushed posteriorly by this ventrally placed mass. A sharp meniscus of contrast is capping the lesion. A very sharp meniscus of contrast is actually uh, capping this lesion and there is enlargement of the uh, ipsilateral subarachnoid space uh, which is best seen on the sagittal CT reconstruction. Okay, so there is enlargement of this ipsilateral subarachnoid space, and uh, these features indicate an extra medullary and uh, intradural location. So, this is an extra medullary intradural location mass, which is uh, showing the typical picture of meningioma. So this is a spinal meningioma and uh, in the differentials you can put schwannoma, uh, metastasis or lymphoma. Next is uh, a 52 year old man presenting with one week history of progressive ataxia, weakness and hyperreflexia. So these are the images that are provided. So as you can see that there is a large band of signal abnormality within the spinal cord and uh, this band is actually hyper intense on T2 MRI sequence. On post contrast sequence uh, we can see that there is patchy enhancement and much of this enhancement is peripheral. Okay, So there is patchy enhancement and much of this enhancement is peripheral. And this lesion is producing very little mass effect. There is no mass effect here, quite evident. So this is a case of acute transverse myelitis. And in the differentials, you can include multiple sclerosis, spinal cord tumor, this astrocytoma, or spinal cord infarction. Next is 73-year-old man with long-standing dizziness. And these are the images that are provided. So you can see that there is a large dumbbell shaped, well marginated extradural mass which is uh, extending, this is extending through the C1 2 neural foramen and it is compressing the cervical spinal cord. It is compressing the cervical spinal cord. This mass is uh, hyper intense on D2. And uh, here, okay, so it is hyper intense on T2 and it shows a heterogeneous, a heterogeneous post contrast enhancement here. So, this heterogeneous post contrast uh, here is heterogeneous post contrast enhancement and it is hyper intense on T2. And uh, the posterior arch of the C1 is remodeled here 
as you can see that this is the posterior arch of the C1 and it is remodeled here. Uh, so this is indicating that this is a long-standing process. So this is a spinal nerve sheet tumor. This is a spinal nerve sheet tumor and uh, in the differentials you can include schwannoma, uh, neurofibroma, meningioma, metastasis or any primary osseous tumor.